Hey guys, welcome to the Saturday special edition. That's what I'm calling it, at least. Normally I do a show with all kinds of different elements, a whole news recap, two guests, music, jokes, the whole thing. That's why I call the show. But I often have great conversations that I want to add and share on the weekend. And that's why I like to do Saturdays with Siegel every time to time now and then. My friend, Professor Eric Siegel, who is a constitutional law scholar at Georgia State University, highly respected academic, uh, who has had a wonderful career. He's the author of two great books, Supreme Myths and Originalism as Faith. He's also the host of the Supreme Myths podcast, and he's written numerous articles, published in all the most important journalistic and legal thrillers. Okay, publications. Uh, across the country, and he's on Twitter at E. Spin Siegel. I talked to him about what's going on locally and across the country with the anti-gay movement that we're seeing, including in my community. That part of it starts at about 10 minutes. But first, he had to rail on Justice Thomas and what he thinks is the future of America if Justice Thomas and the conservatives get their way on the court But anybody listening, conservative or liberal, will really appreciate the tough calls we have to make when it comes to hate speech and freedom of speech in schools. And he explains so much and has such an interesting point of view. I think I provide all of the different right arguments. So I hope that you appreciate today's special edition. I hope you'll subscribe to the show if you haven't already. And let's go right now with Professor Eric Siegel, Georgia State University. Hello. Saturdays with Siegel. We're here. Let's I have a Saturdays with Siegel and Justice Thomas. Why is he joining us? Um, there are so many reasons. How Where did you I get begin? him booked? <laughs> he, he, we both know he will not come to Georgia State. UGA, Emory, Mercer and Macon, have uh, you, John ha- Marshall. Have, you, has that, have they invited him? Over and over you and have. over okay. and over. You want Justice that's, Clarence Thomas to come to your law school to speak? That's not my point. That's not my point. We've no. given him heartwarming invitations for like 25 years. He refuses to come. OK, All right. well, we've had we have had. I don't blame him Scalia. with liberal. He's going to have to deal with liberals like you. We have had Scalia. We have had Kennedy. Mm. We have had O'Connor twice. Oh, wow. We have had Ginsburg um, and a former Justice Stevens clerk who happens to be African-American who teaches at my law school who was friendly with Thomas while she was, a, uh, Thomas is friendly to the clerks. They, you know, in person, I've said this before, he's a friendly guy in person. Mm-hmm. He is a devil in his heart, but in, in person, he's friendly. He liked her. They had lunch several times and they, and she wrote him and said, um, I, it wasn't me. I, I, I was the one who used to write him like years ago, but then she wrote him and said, Justice Thomas, we had this, this lecture series. We've had Scalia and, and, Ring, and, and Kennedy and Ginsburg and et cetera, et cetera. We'd love to have you come. This is an open ended invitation. You tell us when you want to come and we will make it work because you are Supreme Court Justice of our state, state of Georgia. No. His answer was simply no. Hmm. It's unbelievable. All right. Well, anyway, he's in the news. He's in the news. Are we, are we taping? Yeah. Okay. He's in the news because sometime this week he took a picture with Herschel Walker. Uh, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas and uh, Herschel Walker in a photo? Yes. Okay. And Sounds great. There were a lot of well, except Herschel Walker is running for Senate in Georgia. Okay. Well, he's he has uh, it's legal. He can he can take a picture with anybody he wants, and Justice Thomas can take a picture with anybody he wants. He can. Sitting Supreme Court justices probably shouldn't get involved in political campaigns. Have they in the past? Um, in in active political campaigns, I don't know the. I mean, Ginsburg said some. Things about Trump, which we all know about. She shouldn't have said. I wrote a blog post saying she shouldn't have said. You're saying that a uh, Supreme Court justice should not be appearing to support a one candidate yes. in any election anywhere because that yes. looks like yes. they're not a judge. Of course. But here's what I really want to <laughs> say about Justice Thomas. Pete, you can cut this out. I'm saying this to the audience. You, 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 if you don't hear what's going to happen over the next two minutes, that's because Pete cut it out for good reasons. Can I read to you what Justice Thomas's America looks like? And the reason I want to do this is because, and I've been saying this on your show, you know, since I've been on your show, but I once wrote a piece that said Justice Justice Thomas, originalist or GOPist, meaning Republican. Right. And can I just read you what his, if he, if he, if there, and this, this may happen over the next 10 years, 
But if there were five Justice Thomases on the court, this yeah. is what America can look like. Well, isn't it like. just, uh, do you have to read it, or could you just read The Handmaid Cell by Margaret Atwood? One of those two things, but I think mine is slightly more relevant. I'm not going to read. I'm going to pa- I'm going to try to make it more enjoyable for the for the audience. But can I just read you Justice Thomas's America? Or not can I tell you Justice Thomas's? America? Can you just keep talking about potentially doing it? <laughs> it's Saturday, man. All right, here we go. You ready? Justice Thomas's America is one in which Americans possess strong rights to own guns, but no rights to reproductive freedom, where no government, city, state, or federal may take racial criteria into account to do something about our incredibly racist past, where gays and lesbians and trans folks are literally strangers to equal rights under the law, where Congress is not allowed to address serious economic issues that plague our country, national economic issues, where the protections for criminal defendants that we take that are so important in this country in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth amendments barely exist where corporations may spend as much money on elections as they want because money is speech and corporations are people, where the president of the United States may fight terrorism without any constitutional check infringing the rights of all Americans at any time, anywhere, any place. That's not an overstatement. Where state and local governments are practically prohibited from regulating the use of private property for the common good, where states are allowed to place term limits on members of Congress, And most importantly, in our world today, where the rights of majority religions constitute trump cards, authorizing discrimination against minorities and traditionally disadvantaged groups. Now, one more thing. All of that is based on originalism, according to Justice Thomas, and he doesn't believe in precedent at the Supreme Court. He said he would would overturn any case that was wrongly decided, pretty much. If I conclude with this, it takes a special insight, a special intelligence and a special feeling of superiority to think that one's own perspective on the complex relationships between constitutional text, contested American history, and the rights and privileges of our people and our governments can be resolved neutrally and objectively through an originalist methodology and yet end up exactly with the political platform of the 1992 Republican Party. Yeah, I envy that kind of insight. Yes, and you can read this at Dorfon Law, and you yeah, wrote well, this. July second, it's July second, two thousand sixteen. Yeah, I'll link to time. I'll link to it in the show notes for this episode. But Justice Thomas's America, originalist yes. or Republican, and you just read from some of that. And if people want yeah. to reference it or yeah. quote it, just and you don't find the link, Google Google Siegel Thomas GOP, and it's the top hit. I found out. Um, um, Pete. On a, on a time more, so that's been true you know, for a long time. Yeah. On, a, on a timely note, um, Justice Barrett is with Mitch McConnell in Kentucky. Justice Thomas is taking pictures with Warnock. Mm-hmm. Justice Alito is going around, did go around the country to talk at Christian groups about the alleged threat to religious freedom right out of Fox News. Um, and all of this is happening while all the Supreme Court, all liberals and conservatives, not all of them, but I mean, justice on both sides including Sotomayor, have tried to tell the American people that they're not a political institution. Right. And so so there's so the difference you're not seeing liberal justices campaigning and tacitly endorsing current or Ginsburg did. Well, Ginsburg Ginsburg made a comment about Trump. Yes. Did did she appear with a candidate somewhere? I mean, how I don't know. Is there a real double step? Pete, let's take let's take judicial notice. Is that, that's a term of art. So when 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 a trial is going on, mm-hmm. and like, what was the weather on April nineteenth, nineteen seventy five? Well, Your Honor, I have a, a I have a, a almanac here that tells us exactly what the weather was that day. Can we take judicial notice of that? You now, some or judicial notice the sky is, looks blue or whatever. Let's take judicial notice that Ginsburg did some unethical and weird things okay. in the last few years on the court. I don't. It's just it's just a fact. Like, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to wipe that under the counter. That's a terrible. Why did I say wipe under the counter? Yeah, that you, you did. Know you said that. Sweep it under the rug. You're not. Uh, go <laughs> Thank ahead. You. Yeah, <laughs> fine. Saturday. Housekeeping. Yeah. <laughs> Saturday is the seagull is bad. Anyway, so so <laughs> that. But but having said that, you know, the Supreme Court justices in the 1950s played poker with the president. I mean, my my point here is not that Justice Thomas is any more partisan than Justice Ginsburg, or for that matter, any other. He's not. I mean, he might be a little bit because of his wife, but that's not my point. My 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 real point here is. That's just 
stop. Just stop. It's a political institution mm. that makes decisions, not 100 percent politically, but mostly politically. Um, and more, more important than those observations are these. Thomas Alito vote conservative all the time. Ginsburg and Sotomayor vote progressive, voted, vote and voted progressive all the time. Kennedy, White, Souter, Blackman, they all were moderates. And guess what they voted? Moderate, back and forth, right. all the time. Can we just stop? Like, they're not judges. I'm just tired right. of that. And it's, you've it's, been saying this yes. since you're, I mean, whenever you published no, your books, Supreme Myths, yes, of saying, course, and I've long before it, yeah. Long before that. Yeah. I, I just want to be clear. I'm just tired of the mythology. And, they, and by the way, there is one difference, I think, between the current justices on the right and the current justices on the left, leaving aside Justice Brown or soon to be Justice Jackson, I mean, who I don't know at all. Um, but over the last 25 years, other than Ginsburg, you're right. The, the, this, it's not a both sides. thing. The, the conservative justices preach to the American people through the media, through various outlets right. and through their connections to Republican politicians in ways that are worse than Democrats. But there have been times in our history when Democrats did it worse than Republicans. So it's just it's, it's the institution that's broken, not the people, except for Justice Thomas, who, in fact, is broken. Uh, before we get to my issue, do you have anything yeah. else that you wanted to share this weekend that you were I, planning no. to rant about? Because my issue is uh, a speech Let's issue. Talk about yours. Can, can, can I interview you about your issue? Uh, yeah, but let me read. You can. Sure. But let me read okay. what I posted. So re- listening gets sure. context. Yes. So there is a, an incident that took place at my daughter's middle school in Clarkstown, New York. I don't mind reporting it. I think actually local news. I, I, I don't know if it would be good or bad, but I, I kind of want the, the world to know about what happened. And what happened was a horrible act of ignorance and hatred. And it, yesterday uh, across the country was something called the annual day of silence, which is an organized kind of, you know, one of these days, Every cause has it, right? But the day mm-hmm. of silence is meant to be a day of, of action, to spread awareness about the effects of bullying and harassment, specifically of students and people, well, in this case, students, because of school, I think, that identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning. And I like that one, questioning students. Uh, anyway, in the U.S., students take a day-long vow of silence to symbolically represent the silencing of LGBTQ students So my daughter and many others did their best to support this cause wearing some wore black, some wore wore black and had a pin on that said LGBT Day of Silence. Uh, Julia, you should know, was concerned, Siegel, because she's like, I want to support the cause, but I also want to talk. So she wore the pin, but. Yeah, I think they all talked. Some of them probably uh, did, did a good job of not. But anyway, sadly, there was a contingent, sadly and tragically, a contingent of kids that were wearing shirts that had written on them straight marriage. And then they were bullying the silent allies, the kids with pens, uh, pins and wearing black uh, uh, by pulling on their pins in their backpacks, trying to get them to talk on this day of silence. They're trying to get them to talk. Pause right there. I I read that. I mean, this is great. It's very well written. Just pause right there for a second. I got to ask, did they not get in trouble? Don't know yet. I mean, physically touching people? That's that's salt. Don't know yet. Hopefully. Okay, go on. Uh, Sorry. Okay, the, go on. They Sorry. also were passing around, apparently, a petition that they wanted students passing around a petition. They wanted other students to sign affirming that they were straight. So these students had T-shirts where, uh, that said straight marriage <clears throat> on it. They were passing around a petition and they were taunting the kids wearing the pins and physically, in some cases, pulling on their backpacks and trying and their pins my daughter did not see this, did not witness this. It was in one grade, specifically, apparently, in one class. The details are coming about. The BOE is looking into it. But I have three sources, including a teacher, telling me this, which is why I feel like it's okay to talk about and post publicly. Um, and now I have actually more sources than that at this point. So, so that's what happened. And the question becomes, and this was a question at the BOE meeting here in my town, about political speech or about things that you wear to school on T-shirts and hats and so on that are offensive to people that might be considered hate speech. And where does that start and end is is, is where you and I can maybe start. In. But yeah, ask me anything else you want about it. But 
Right. Wow. I so think you're things. the one to answer a questions couple, you're, you're, th This story prompted a tweet from me, and I want to start here because I think this is where it starts. This is what I wrote this morning. Oh. The, the overt, not, I didn't reference you, but just you sparked this. The oh. overt discrimination against LGBTQ folks is not an issue reasonable people can disagree about. It is wrong. It is immoral. It is anti-Christian. And it should never be justified because of faith. Faith based on hate is hate. Let's start there. Do we have any reason to think these kids were religious? Was this a religious objection? I have no insights. Oh, yes. You did. Well, you did see uh, as the argument played out in our one of our community Facebook pages where it's just nuts. They there were articulations. We don't know if they're the, 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 the families of the students, but people who are basically defending saying they are discriminated against because their kids are Christian and they don't believe right. in gay right. marriage and they're being discriminated against. What about that? And so they have victimized it, themselves right. for their right. not being able to have uh, feeling they're bullied for their beliefs in straight marriage. I'm going to plug a book I'm reading. I've been plugging it on Twitter. It's not out yet. It's forthcoming. And you need to have this guy on your show. We'll, we'll get to it when, when the book comes out called American Crusade. And, and it's about, and it's by the, the, the right now, the a lawyer for Americans United for separation of church and state. One of the themes of the book is that, and this is why I write about this. And, you know, I've written about this before is that Christians strike that sentence, strike that word is that people think that discrimination based on some kind of faith-based principle is somehow not discrimination. Now, that's wrong 99% of the time. Now, of course, no temple has to hire a priest, and no church, no, no Catholic church has to hire an openly gay person to serve the religious mission of the institution, because we do believe in freedom of religion in this country, even for people who are hateful. But the fact, and of course, it's stupid to think of a you know, Catholic minister leading a temple or something. But 99% of the time, whether it's wedding cakes, wedding flowers, schools, the incident at your school, the idea that religion can somehow justify minimizing and hurting other people is A, horrific. As we, but more, and as importantly, and more in my bailiwick, and we'll get to the free speech issues in a second. This is the Supreme Court, Pete. The Supreme Court has been, ever since Obergefell and, and Justice Kennedy wrote an opinion with the four liberals to strike down same-sex marriage bans at the state level. In that opinion, Justice Kennedy said something like, of course, some people will, some religious people will disagree with this, and we're not going to make them violate their religion, or so some, some, some very throwaway line like that. Um, but it was picked up on, and I'm telling you that Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Barrett, this includes Roberts, and Alito, and Thomas, all want to punish gays and lesbians for Obergefell. They do. And for gay marriage. For, what, for gay marriage. Well, I, well for, the court, for the court requiring gay marriage. If this had been done at the state level, I don't think these... There are Supreme Court these, just the conservative Supreme Court justices you just named want revenge for yes. the decision that yes. the liberals, along with the others yes. you just mentioned, so for Kennedy. The first time in, so for the first time in American history, the court ruled a couple years ago that a public school, a state that funds private non-religious schools um, because they want their kids edu educated wherever they're in school, but didn't want to fund religious schools because they didn't want to fund, use taxpayer dollars to support religion. Um, the Supreme Court ruled, no, if you fund secular schools, you have to fund religious schools. Hmm. This, this, this term in June of this year, Maine has a problem. Maine has really small towns throughout it where really having public schools are, are impossible unless you go really far away. So state of Maine subsidizes some private secular schools, but the state of Maine does not want to subsidize private religious schools under the theory that if you want to go, we, we will help you, your child get an education. But if you want it at a religious school, then you got to pay for it. Nothing wrong with that. The Supreme Court is going to strike that down. Now, people are going to People, what the court is meaning doing, they're going to strike it down, meaning that states will have to subsidize re yes. the religious teachings. Yes. Now, part of this is so just we should the teach religious. some hardcore fundamentalist yes. Yes. Islam yes. or Judaism. Yes. Yes. And everything that's happening in my hometown. And See my how they like that about, about teaching divisive topics and, and all that. They wouldn't. Well, yeah. In Maine, there, I, I doubt. So the thing so that in that Montana case I was telling you about, um, 
every religious school in the state of Montana was Christian. Everyone. Right. So one right. of the points this great book, American Crusade, makes, this is going to go back to your issue in a second, is it's not really pro-religion. Every now and then the court will issue a decision to help a Muslim, a prisoner, or something like that. That will happen. We, we concede that. But they do that every now and then. But the overwhelming political view of this court is that Christianity should triumph in this country. It just is. Um, now, going back to your stuff. So, Pete, I guess to me, a counter protest to the one, uh, 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 counter maybe the wrong word. If kids are really opposed to same sex marriage, I don't know why they would be, but if they are, then non combative opposing type speech, like wearing a shirt that says, I believe in straight marriage. No, I think we have to, we have to allow that. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's, I don't, I think the sentiment is immoral and vile and ghastly, but we do have free speech in this country. And for schools, the test specifically is, is this going to get in the way of the pedagogical mission? That's where it gets difficult. And that's where it gets controversial. But I will tell you, that last year, the Supreme Court decided a case. We talked about this, you and I, not involving religion or gay rights, but involving speech in school or outside of school, where a student used Facebook to criticize her cheerleading team. Or I was, I'm sorry, some social media. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was Instagram. I, I, I have no idea. But whatever it was, she used social media outside of school to criticize her cheerleading team. She was punished for it because the cheerleading team had a rule saying you can't criticize the team. And the Supreme Court overturned that. Hmm. It said that that violated the First Amendment, and that wasn't even by, the the, the rule they had saying you can't punishing her. No, 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 no. That no, that they, they didn't touch that. They 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 reversed her punishment. They said her punishment was illegal. Her they punishment was illegal because yeah. I mean, yeah, because that guy got I mean, there were no good reasons. I mean, I well, I didn't just hear. Thing. All I heard was a gobbledygook of words. What just that's happened? What I meant to, that's what I meant to say. Uh, that was on purpose. Um, oh, I, I, that case actually raises a couple hard issues, but here's my deal. Yeah. The cheerleading team had a rule. You can't criticize the cheerleading team if you're on the team. I, I don't know if I like that rule or not, but I, it's certainly constitutional. Then she criticizes the team. Then she gets suspended for the team for a year for criticizing the team, i.e. violating the well, rules. Here, of the team. Okay, so here's wait, 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 one last sentence. Why is the Supreme Court getting involved at all? Why are any courts getting involved that's at a, all? That's, that's maybe a I mean, why shouldn't they? Because this is a local school doing a local thing involving a violation of a team rule that I think is whether 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 reasonable or not is clearly constitutional. If you want to play basketball or football or be on the cheerleading team, you have to promise not to criticize, not to bring the team in disrepute. It's basically I'm paraphrasing. That's basically what it is. I think that's fine for a high school. I, I think I think that's fine. But um, how is that not how is that not an infringement on her freedom of speech? Because she doesn't. Well, for the same reason why when in math class, she's not allowed to stand up and say, I love John Lewis or I hate John Lewis or whatever. Um, the school has a pedagogical interest in teaching things. And if one of the things they want to teach in their extracurricular activities is teamwork and spirit and camaraderie and unification to a cause. Now, they can't say if you want to be on this team, you can't criticize Republicans. Or, and they can't even say if you want to be on this team, you can't talk politics. No, that's that's unconstitutional. But if you want to be on this team, you can't okay. publicly bring this team hmm. in disrepute. I have no problem with that. OK, but I, 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 how about no this yeah. right now at and schools across the country? There is a debate. Uh, we could talk about parental rights. That's the phrase they're using. But there is yeah. a debate now, certainly in my school, uh, of what you can wear and on your, you know, on your body in terms of T-shirts or hats, or whatever. And so the board's point of view is: listen, it just can't be hate speech, and they want to move on, right? Well, the community wants hate speech defined. The community, many in the community, think. The, the words Black Lives Matter are specifically a form of hate speech against police officers. Uh, some people are anti-gay and they see that rainbow and they're offended by it. They're triggered by it. And maybe that's hate speech. Well, no, 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 no. Hold on. Back up. Let's be clear about two things. First of all, hate speech is allowed under the Constitution. 
uh, by by our Supreme. In other words, you can hate speech is fully protected under the First Amendment. What's not protected, Pete, are fighting words, and those are different things. Those are very different things. Fighting words. Fighting words. The doctrine. So people get this confused all the freaking okay. time. I'm allowed to wear a shirt that says pretty much anything. I, I want to think of the most racist or most whatever. I hate hateful. blank people. I hate blank people. I'm allowed to wear that shirt uh, in public. I just am. I'm even. I'm also allowed to have a microphone in public and say I hate these people. I'm even allowed to have a microphone and say I hate. I'll do it this way. I hate all Jews. They should all go back to Israel. Well, the the, allowed- the 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 Hebrew Israelites, which are these black fundamentalist religious kind of fringe sect uh, of religion. Uh, they stand in Times Square. They they dress like the intercontinental champion of right. uh, the wrestling. Like they look like they just have uh, really weird costumes. Right. I'll call them, and they say the most vile things about white and people and Jews, and right. and, or, and, and they and stand they there right. on the corner and they are protected. Yes. yes. Now here's what they can't do. There comes a point where if they approach a individual person or group with language that rises to the level of a threat, then we get to the fighting words doctrine. I am not allowed to walk up to Pete Dominic and say, you motherfucking son of a bitch, I can't believe you're fighting for the rights for gay and lesbian people, and I'm going to fucking do something about it. No, that I can't do. Not in your face, because that's harassment. That's, that's not harassment, fighting words, direct threats. There's actually a doctrine called the true threat doctrine, and, and it kind of goes hand in hand with fighting words. But that's not hate speech. In, the, in, in Germany, you're not allowed to display a swastika. A, displaying a swastika in, in, a, in a serious way, as opposed to like in a comedy show or something, is obviously a hate speech. If you're saying, I'm in favor of this symbol, then you're saying, I hate Jews, basically. And mm-hmm. Jews should be killed. Um, you can't do that in Germany. Here you can. Now, whether it's right or wrong, now, we can have, you and I have talked before, whether that's the right way to approach this or not. But you're allowed to do that. And that's not constitutionally right, in so, doubt. So come back to the that. code of conduct that schools yes. are, are arguing and debating. Come back to that and, it, and it help me understand right. what the question about to hate speech. Extent, right. To the extent those students were in any way physically threatening anybody, that they were out of free speech, we're no longer in free speech, and they don't have the right to do it. In schools or any place else, the school doesn't make a difference on that. You're not allowed to physically harass, intimidate. So if they pulled on their pins or pulled on their backpacks, not protected in any way, shape or form. There's zero, there's zero constitutional protection. for that. What's, what's hard about this issue with schools, Pete, and I don't know where I come out on this. It's really hard. You know me, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I have a lot of strong opinions here. I don't know. I don't know. So let's say two thirds of us, let's take, let's take a public school that I'm familiar with, like in downtown Atlanta or midtown Atlanta. You know, which is going to be fairly diverse and fairly liberal and fairly progressive. And a bunch of students, probably the majority, want to express their um, support for LGBTQ folks and for same sex marriage. And they wear shirts and bring rainbow, you know, flags that aren't used for any physical purposes and other symbols to show this support. We have to allow people who don't believe in same sex marriage, even though I think it's pernicious and horrible, the same rights. Here's where it gets hard. If the school knows that the pro same sex marriage people and the anti same sex marriage people or whatever are going to have a clash, well, that's going to get in the way of the pedagogical concerns of the school. It just is, obviously. And how to navigate that, both in terms of policy and in terms of law, is really difficult. And I would never want to be an administrator. Um, I had, Pete, actually, I had a similar experience. Um, I've never told you this story. And it's, I don't want to distract from your school stuff, which is really serious. But but can I tell this real quick? Because it's not easy. Yeah, but it's I kind of feel like I want to send this to my board of education. And if you were sitting there on the board and this incident happened, I mean, how right. do no, you... No, well, ha- this story reflects that. This story reflects on that. This, this story, story reflects, reflects that, the yeah. answer to yeah. that question. Yeah. No, about not, not the answer, an approach. Okay. An approach. Now, law schools are different than you know middle schools and high schools. But I'm not sure it's different in this way. In the 1990s, we had a symposium in my law school that I organized and ran on federalism, not the point of the story. Big names, big, big names, Ernst Chemerinsky, big, big names were there. I invited, you know, I tried to invite a bunch of conservatives, because I, I believe in having both sides represented, as you know. So I invited a guy named Lino Gralia, who just passed away. Lino was a professor at the University of Texas, and a week before our symposium, 
he made incredibly racist statements about affirmative action and blacks at the University of Texas. Really bad. So oh, we have a black law student society. And they went to the dean and said, cancel him. Don't let him come. This is the 1990s. Don't let him come. He is a racist. He has no business being in this law school. Right. And we're not going to let him come. We're going to protest. We're going to block the doors. He does not belong in this public law school in the middle of downtown Atlanta, where just 20 years ago, I'm sorry, just 40 years ago, a hotel went to the Supreme Court saying, we don't have, we don't have to take blacks. So it was a real problem for my law school. And uh, I, I was invited. It was my symposium. So I was involved in the meetings on, meetings on how to deal with this problem. And we were trying to be sympathetic to both sides of it. And it was really hard. And eventually the deal we worked out with the black students was um, they could protest as much as they want outside the, the auditorium quietly. And they said to us, what we want to do is when he stands up, we want to turn our backs. And we're talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 people in a room of 200. We want to turn our backs very visibly. We'll do it quietly. But it's going to be distracting. We want to turn our backs when he speaks. And we thought about when he speaks. And we thought about it for a long time. And we decided, okay, that seems like a reasonable middle ground. What actually happened was I was about to introduce him. And the black students stood up and some white students. And they turned their backs. And he gave, and then I introduced him. They were quiet. Um, right before I said, and here's Professor Gralia, they didn't tell me they were going to do this. They all marched right towards the podium and was a little bit of an aggressive move, but then they just walked out the side door. And then he spoke, and they were protesting outside, and it all went well. I think that was a win-win-win for everybody. I think. So if I'm a, so to your school board here, even though I personally find the views of those students who are protesting what was going on that day, pernicious, evil, and immoral. They have the right to express their views as much as the kids who are supporting LGBTQ folks have the right to express their views. <sighs> so the best solution is one. I, I know free speech is hard. Believe me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Now, once we bring in physical intimidation, everything changes and all the rules change. Those kids should be punished. If any kid was touched against their will, that should happen as a normal court. In my, in my kid's school, you touch somebody against their will and they complain about it, pretty bad. I mean, you know, we, we don't want unwanted touchings in middle and high schools. Um, your school board needs to find a way to allow this, all of this speech or none of this speech. But it can't allow some. That's the worst part of it. They can't allow some. It's not allowed. It, that's that's the worst thing a government can do. It's called viewpoint discrimination. And even if the viewpoint is offensive as hell, I don't think schools can just shut it down. Um, as a policy matter, I don't think society can shut it down because when you shut down hateful speech, I think it turns into violence. Mm. You know. And now I'm not. No, I don't believe. Now, by the way, that's the Supreme Court's view. That's the constitutional law view in this country. It is not the constitutional law view in, in England, France, Germany, and Spain. And they all have free speech in those countries. My, my policy view is simply my opinion. I don't think my opinion should be part of the Constitution. Um, that's a whole different subject. Right. 99% of American law professors do. I don't. But Pete, what are you going to do with these kids? Like what? Forget, let's, say the, let's say the same thing happened, but no physical touching. Mm. And there was just a lot of angst. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I mean... It, you can't favor one speech over the other. It's just really tough. Not in a public school. It's really tough. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, you bring up a lot of really interesting, important arguments. And I think it is obviously a really challenging situation. I think that clearly, challenging. clearly challenging. the problem here is ignorance, which breeds hatred and fear. And that's why educational institutes of lower, uh, you know, young people should be exposed to as much education and, and different views on things, especially if they don't have someone of a, of a certain religion or they don't know anybody in certain sexual orientation. There should be programming that has traditionally been called use words like diversity and equity and inclusion type programming to educate people. We understand 
kids are ignorant. I'm still ignorant on so many things. That's why schools should provide education in every type. So, yes, you have a book in the library that is from the point of view of a student who is questioning their identity, a novel, whatever. That's what should be done. It's tough to make these decisions on what a kid can wear. What's not tough is that we should bring in speakers and offer all kinds of resources to educate what I would call the really ignorant families and, and, and kids as to what it means to be and identify as LGBT and the history of the violence against them and how this is where it begins. How about that? No, I think that's all correct. I, I do think, though, that's in principle, 100 percent on the ground. If I'm a school principal and I know that there's going to be a clash of ideas that's going to get in the way of the pedagogical mission of my school, my options are limited. And it's really hard. My, at a law school, I mean, Pete, we, there was so many. The reason I brought up my story was just we went through all the options. Should we cancel him? Because what he said was pernicious and awful. He said a pernicious and awful thing. And we, should we cancel him? Should we make a special statement that we don't support his ideas? Should we let the students protest during his speech as loudly as they want? Should we ban all protests? It, you know, every option was on the table. The, the point I want to make is even with much more mature law students. Pete, it's really hard. So I think it, it's really hard when we, if, if what, what's not hard is the physical touching. That's easy. Can't do right. it. Don't right. do it. You right. it. Yeah, well, but leaving that issue aside, the rest of it is really hard. Do I want pernicious anti LGBTQ views ex- exposed, expressed at, at my kids' schools? No, not really. They're going to find it in our society, though. Um, can I ask you a question about all this? Sure. Have you ever met a person? who is just absolutely vehemently anti-gay, who's not religious. I haven't met them. I, you know, I, I can only make assumptions about the people who called the live radio show for years who held those views. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, the point I'm making with that, and it's relevant to your situation. I'd love to know the religious but, affiliation. But I of think, but I think that the gay issue has become blurred and confused for a lot of parents our age ish. Uh, because of the T and the questioning. So trans uh, and, yes. and, and yes. questioning yes. are are something that are harder for, and that's fair. It's harder for this generation of parents yes. to kind of understand what it means and, and, and how it works and what should be done about that. And so I think there are now a lot of people who, who aren't necessarily overtly religious that are deeply troubled, confused, and terrified of the idea that maybe their child might identify uh, as something that that would be, you know, different from their their, their so, so, so I'm involved in this right now uh, in many different ways. And um, one of and one of my kids teachers who is an openly gay man and has been for 25 years um, and is the head of the LGBTQ, you know, support group at my kids school told us that over the last two years, um, really starting with COVID and, and, and to today, but really over the last year. The number of children identifying as gender non-binary or gender bi- and trans now includes that. It's not just it's not just changing your physical organs and change. It, it, it's it's a spectrum. Um, it's something that he, this openly gay man for twenty five years, is having a really hard time navigating, and it's complex and and it's and it's difficult. And I'm totally onto all of that. But here's what I think about that, though, Pete. I it's not that parents have a moral judgment about that. It's that there are, I don't, I really, and these, I, I mean, some parents do. I mean, I mean, the, the, I think most people of yours and mine groups, not that we have any moral judgments about that. I have no moral judgment about it at all. I have some questions about how young kids ought to be before they start, you know, acting on these kinds of beliefs that 12, 16, 18, I don't know the right answer. And I have some questions about other things involving medical issues. But the bottom line is if your kid is trans or thinks they might be trans or is questioning or is gender fluid or is gender non-binary, here's the thing. Love them and support them and give them what they need to thrive, not controversial. That's not what your those kids at your school were doing. And the parents of those kids, my guess, are not saying we. this is all new. Everything about this is like 10 years old in terms of the, the mm-hmm. gender non-binary and all that stuff. I mean, of course, there were trans people forever, but it's only been a my 
this gay, gay teacher said it's like, you know, huge numbers, more than he's ever seen times 20 in his 25 years of teaching. But if it's your kid, for goodness sake, just love them. I mean, just support them, which doesn't mean let them change their bodies at 13. Right. I mean, we're still parents. We have to do what we think is best, all things considered, medically and all and everything. But that's a different issue. What I want to talk about is the hatred of LGBTQ, LGBT, of, of gays and lesbians, which I think now in this country is primarily a religious war. Doesn't mean everybody, but it's a religious war. And Pete, this is really serious because we have a Supreme Court that supports that war. They talk about the war on religious freedom is really I, I am surprised by how fast this has happened. Mm. LGBTQ rights are being attacked left, right, and center everywhere. And uh, I'm really worried about it. And I'm shocked by it. And your story is an, is just one more data yeah, point. Yeah, I, I, I really was naive. Terrifying. About Terrifying. the this this issue. I thought that the vast majority of Americans, obviously there are a lot of outliers in certain places and certain right. demographics and obviously generationally on the LGBT issue, but I overwhelmingly thought what would the court decide in it and then what would it be in place? And as we always argued, once you get to know it, say gay married couple, right. a lot of your right. concerns start to fall away. Not always, but for right. most people. I and, thought, so I, I, wait, hold on. Let me, I agree with every syllable you just uttered, mm-hmm. and I know where you and I went wrong. We talked about this, you mm-hmm. and I, and I've told you, I've said on your sh- on your show many times. I don't think Supreme Court will ever overturn, you know, the same sex marriage cases. How do you untie those knots? How do you right? What How you do you take away a right? Right. How, what you and I underestimated, uh, and I, and for me, it's really unforgivable because yeah. I've been finding this my entire life is religion. This country. I mean, what you and yeah. I have. Well, uh, why did we underestimate religion? Because religion, by every single data point, is waning in this country. I know, but that, that's, that's, that, that's exactly it. So remember Andrew Young. Let's go back to Andrew Young. Sure. And something Anytime. I've said to you many times. Mm-hmm. Andrew Young came to Vanderbilt Law School my, to speak um, when I was at Vanderbilt Law School in 1982. I don't want any age jokes. In 1982, I was I think in law you just school. made one. And <laughs> where were you in 1982? I was, uh, at, I was in... Um, uh, first grade, I think. <laughs> yeah. okay, I'm hanging up now. It was nice talking to you, Pete. Have a good day. I was sitting um, on Julie Lynn. Uh, I shouldn't say her last name. I was sitting on a girl, a five-year-old girl's lap, and that's when I knew I was into girls. And Andrew Young came to my school, and he said the biggest motivating factor for the KKK, which is not something he was, def- obviously, Andrew Young's not defending the KKK. He said to fight them, you have to understand them. That's fair, right? To fight them, you have sure. to understand. Sure, sure. And he said, to understand them, you just have to take, sit in their shoes just for one minute. Sure. And they're scared. They're scared of their way of life going away. Now, that doesn't mean we don't fight them with their tooth and nail, but that's what that's what's motivating them. What's and and so you just said, our country is becoming less and less religious all the time. Every report I've read supports that idea. They're afraid that. And when I say they here, I mean Orthodox Jews, some Muslim sects, and some sects of Christianity. The more the, the fundamental parts of all three of those religions. They're afraid their way of life is going away. Now, why gay people are a threat to them, I've never understood. Well, their way of life I've is their way of life is going away. They well, are, that's their motivation. They, that's that they're afraid. That's why well, they're they, yeah, they should, they're I understand their fear. I understand, and I understand their viewpoints. I think I do. And I understand them. I think they're pernicious. But I well, I mean, I th- listen, they're, the way I see it is pretty simple. If you're holding someone back from a right, right. right. then you're in the wrong. If you have that yeah. right and they don't, you're wrong. I don't care your religion or your belief. If you can vote and they can't and you're the same age, then you're wrong. So if how, you, so if you can right. get married right. and, you, right. and, they, and they can't because they like the same gender – then you're wrong. And, and, and Pete, and the court is overcompensating. So, and, and the court, and the court, so um, I just tweeted this the other day um, in this book I'm reading, American Crusade. Amy Coney Barrett was a paid teacher for a group called ADF. ADF is litigating a lot of these religion cases in the Supreme Court. She was a paid teacher for them from two, I mean, on, on the wrong side for, you know, against gays and all that. Amy Coney Barrett was a paid ADF teacher from 2011 to 2016, delivering lectures to their legal fellows. During her confirmation hearing, 
She claimed she was not, quote, this is her words, not aware of ADF's decades long efforts to recriminalize homosexuality. Impossible. She lied, she lied right? She lied. What I, what, what, what I want, and, and so it's, it's coming out in decisions. So this is how far we've gone. This is how nutty this is. This case came out last year. This is how far we've gone for the Supreme Court protecting religion, inciting more cases and more hate. Philadelphia wants to get have a better system for kids who need to be um, in foster homes. And they have various organizations helping them certify, you know, certify adults to adult these kids, including gay adults and gay marriage, people in gay marriages. And Catholic Social Services said, no, we're never, ever going to approve a gay, a gay couple. Um, but we still want your money. We still want the grant. We still want to help you. Now, this is not a case where they had any rights. In other words, th this is not a case where someone is saying my right to do my occupation or my right to speak or my right to bake a cake or whatever. That's not it. We want government money, but we're not willing to live with the contract that says we can't discriminate against gays and lesbians. But our religion says we're not to we must discriminate against gays and lesbians. So we want your money anyway. There's no scenario ever that case should come out for the Christian group because they're not entitled to them. It's not even a right. They don't have, they have no right to this money. Supreme Court ruled for them. Mm. I mean, and, right. and, 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 and it's going on and on and on. Going full circle here, I still would love to know. I know it's, a small, it's just one event on one school on one day, but I would love to know the religious affiliation of those kids because my guess is they come from religious homes. And, and Pete, I mean, we've been doing this, you know, for 2,000 years. Yeah. Well, let's um, be clear about what their yeah. issue in protest was. It wasn't anything trans. You know, I mentioned how the trans issue has confused a lot of parents' generation. Yeah. Obviously, it's it's, yeah. it's it's a really hard thing to navigate for everybody, and specifically yeah. the child and, and, and less yeah. specifically, but still the, the family. And, yes. and schools, this, and schools, and schools. And definitely schools, society in yeah. general. It's tough. Yeah. But these kids were protesting marriage equality specifically marriage Jesus. equality and they were asking students to affirm but not. Uh, but let me Pete, just finish they were asking students yeah. to affirm that they were straight on specifically on the quote day of silence for lgbt they, they did uh, it I, I on understand. that day you're giving them too much credit Go they're ahead. not protesting marriage so with sophisticated constitutional law professors at some elite or at least very well received law schools I debated for years and years and years and years what it means to say I'm against same-sex marriage. Let's really deconstruct that and figure out what's really going on there. And even at the Prop 8 trial in San Francisco, which you and I talked about live when it was occurring, which was a case involving California's decision to, to limit marriage to men and women, um, and then there's a trial about it, and a very good lawyer was arguing for the for the provision saying marriage is one man and one woman with all of the greatest conservative minds in the country trying to and religious minds trying to figure out a way to say we're against same-sex marriage but we're not against gay people which is what they were trying to do none of them were successful this is not about marriage it's about gay people okay but um, they're not all, but yeah all, but you're, all, you're all, not all they could say all they could say is we want to retain traditional marriage and well, what you're that's saying what, and i agree with they let's say their point is I got no problem with gay marriage. I'm out here supporting straight marriage. I'm touting that, straight marriage. Not, I'm getting kids to affirm that they illogical. are straight. That's, a, that's an illogical position. Why? What they're saying is gays don't get to have the same rights as we do. And that's anti-gay. Full stop. P I have talked to sophisticated, intelligent lawyers. No, but so these students are, are not saying that they're not saying they that. That, that they can't yeah. have whatever rights they want. They're saying we want to also be proud of and support straight marriage. You can you can have gay marriage, but we're supporting straight marriage. Oh, they're saying you can have gay. I don't know they what they're saying. No, I'm I'm I bending doubt. my back over, snapping, trying to make their uh, argument for them, not knowing point. what it okay. is. Maybe this doesn't apply to your protest. What I am saying is, I have listened to patiently dozens of hours right. of the smartest conservatives in the country right. trying to justify their opposition to same sex marriage. And at the end of the day, it comes down to we want to preserve traditional marriage. It's the only thing they ever say. And that means we have a right. And we're not talking about the symbolism of marriage. We're talking about money and visiting your, your spouse in the hospital. And uh, Justice Kennedy listed a thousand federal laws that gave married people rights that non-married people didn't have. And, with, and when they say we're not against gays, we're just against gays getting married legally under the law. 
what they're saying is we have rights we don't want them to have, them meaning gays and lesbians. Not about marriage. It's about gays and lesbians. And that's really sad. And it's but the other way to say it, I guess now I'm arguing against my hypothetical is gay people who are supportive of gay marriage are not unsupportive of straight marriage. People who are not. supportive of gay marriage are simply saying we want the same rights as straight people. We're not taking anything from you. We just of want course. what you have. So it's it's not the same yeah. to say I support gay marriage uh, as I support straight marriage because one is all marriage is the same. All all yeah. marriages matter. And the other yeah. is straight marriages matter. Uh, yes, but I don't I don't want this point to get lost. And you and you and I, in fact, you when you were when you used to have your show on an, um, XM radio, there was someone who was uh, I forget his name. I'm sorry, Pete. There was a, a openly gay man who hosted a, a Michael Angelo Signorelli. He's still there. He's yeah. great. Comes on with me. here. And, yeah. And, yeah. Right. Right. And he and I and, and, and a couple of times we're on the show together. You know, during the right? Prop oh, wow. yeah, cool. Um, I have no memories of anything. <laughs> I don't want this point to get lost. I, most of your audience already gets this, but but I don't want it to get lost. Opposition to same sex marriage is nothing more and nothing less than opposition to equal rights for gays and lesbians. Period. And how do I know that? I know that because I've debated this with the smartest minds in the country, and that's all. And that's all they can eventually say. That's all they can say. Is somehow they're they're reserving. They, they use these words: "We're reserving marriage to what it's always been," or "We're reserving marriage to men and women to protect the sanctity." All that stuff, and that's just code for heterosexuals get rights, important rights, sometimes the most important rights that homosexuals don't get. And that's just discrimination. And I don't care if it's based on faith or anything else. It's it's hate. It's discrimination. It's wrong. And there's no place for it. And it's not secular. So. You you had Sarah Posner on your show, I believe, right? Talking about her book, Unholy. Yeah, yeah, I think a couple you, times. Yeah. Um, this guy, I'm going to have you, David, I'm Andrew Seidel, I hope you have on in the future when his book comes out. It's a great book. But it's all, it's all coming back to the same place. The Koch brothers, heritage, the leadership of Federalist Society, not the Federalist Society, but the leadership of the Federalist Society. And a number of other of the dark money type groups that Senator Whitehouse has been yelling about for years. People think what he's yelling about is politics. It's not. It's religion. At the Leonard Leo, at the, the, the executive vice, the former executive vice president of the Federalist Society, who Trump literally hired to pick his judges in the White House, is beyond everything else he values, beyond capitalism, free enterprise, is religion, is crit, is this very fundamental religious Christian faith. Um, that's what Ed Meese, Ronald Reagan's attorney general, valued. That's what, that's what brought the evangelicals into the fold. And Pete, the Supreme Court is making this worse every term. And what happened at your school, I would just, again, one little protest in one school in one state in America. But I would be very interested in the religious affiliation because I'm almost positive they come from parents who, are, who have very conservative religious views. And you know, Pete, I, at some point we got to call it what it is. I mean, all right, so now I'm going to say something that's going to, me, it's going to get me in trouble. But, mm -hmm. you know, Bill Maher has said it, it's gotten him in trouble. But if anything, hate based on faith is worse than hate based on secular kind of concerns. Because if someone says, um, this is going to make our country worse for these reasons, A, B, and C, we can at least have a debate. But if someone says this is going to make our country worse because I believe in, because someone 2000 years ago wrote something in a holy book, there's no arguing. that, Right. There's no you're wrong. No, it's my faith. I can't be wrong. It's my faith. By definition, can't be wrong. Um, so, in fact, I think discrimination based on faith is much worse than discrimination based on secular criteria. The racism of the South that was based on religion was much worse, was 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 harder to fight than the racism in the South based on politics. And um, we're in deep trouble in this country in a lot of different ways. I'm sorry, I'm next right. But I'm just reading this book. It's this great book about, uh, uh, it's like a third book I've read on this topic in a year about our fundamental Christian friends. Yeah. Pete, yeah. they want to shape this. They, they have no place in their view for diversity, for difference, yeah. for And I just, I just want to make a point about that. I've interviewed okay. most of those authors from Jeff Charlotte yes. to Sarah Posner to yes. Catherine Stewart. Yes. 
uh, yeah. to uh, most recently uh, Dr. Jones, Robert Jones, yeah. And, yeah. and so many more. There's so many great authors doing a lot of yeah. really good work on this. But I think yeah. I have been a bit naive in that thinking that is more for red states and conservative districts that are right. really heavily evangelical. And it's not clearly as evidence from what is happening in my town. These people are, in fact, using religion as an argument. And these people are just run of the mill Catholics. And and if anybody else is religious, Jewish, but it's overwhelmingly Catholics, um, yeah. I would imagine. And yeah. they're not, you know, I, I never thought of this town as overtly Christian or religious. I certainly has been the smaller part of my town conservative, but there's certainly a lot of moderates and progressives as well. But it is, I just am, and I'm saying this as a cautionary tale for folks listening. If you think somehow you are immune to this because you live in a progressive community, these people are, by the way, terrified of the fundamentalist uh, Orthodox Jews here. And I mean, there's, there's a lot going on with property. So and, am I. But, well, so am I. But they don't <laughs> seem to be concerned about their own. They don't see their own views, apparently, I think, as, as, as damaging because they're based on their faith. They're, Form of, yeah. I suppose. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm making I, assumptions here about these folks. I haven't interviewed them, but it certainly but, seems but, to be. But, but we don't need to. We don't need to make assumptions about the folks at your school, though. I'd be curious to know to know that Donald Trump put into power in the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the organization that runs, you know, health care and mm. adopt, all that stuff for the federal government. That Donald Trump put into power, basically. Um, throughout the federal government, evangelical Christians. Well, Betsy DeVos have, would be the, uh, right, the big one. Education. Want, who, but but here, the point I want to make is they don't want equal rights for gays. They don't. They don't want they equal don't. rights for gays and lesbians. They don't. Right. right. Dennis right. Deal does not want equal rights and for gays Betsy and lesbians. And Betsy DeVos was the secretary of education who did yes. not want rights for gays yes. and lesbians and spent and hundreds of millions point, of dollars to... So prevent. Justice Scalia famously said, excuse me, inf- and I got to go, Pete, I'm sorry, in three uh, minutes. Yeah. Scalia infamously said, in one of his rants and one of the gay rights decisions that Kennedy wrote, Scalia's writing in dissent, he said, I'm paraphrasing, many Americans don't want gay people as teachers of their children, as mentors, as et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when he said many Americans don't want that, obviously he was projecting in one sense because he didn't want that. But leaving that aside, he said, it is not for this court to decide that Intolerance of gays and lesbians is the same as intolerance on, on racial grounds or religious grounds. That's what he said. And he's wrong. He was wrong. He's just emphatically, objectively, demonstrably Intolerance wrong. for gays and lesbians is... Is bad. This, it should be a bad thing. And he said the court... And he said many Americans don't think that, and the court should not adopt that view. The court did adopt that view. Justice Kennedy specifically said denying marriage to gays right. and lesbians deprives them of rights and dignity. Right. It does. Mm-hmm. Scalia said many Americans don't want that. I mean, Scalia was objectively correct about that. What I thought was it would go away. It's coming back worse. And we got to fight it. We got to fight it. So what I would say to your school district is um, everybody gets to speak. But you know what? If there were a bunch of Ku Klux Klan people saying and saying racist things against blacks, we might have to let them speak. But we, the school district, would call it out and say, no, we don't support that. We don't support hatred of one racial group. Well, we don't support. So so the Board of Education potentially coming out with a with a statement saying we support marriage equality and gender yes. equality. Yes. And <laughs> yes, that marriage equality should no longer be controversial. Gender. Well, equality I, that, well that was my naive naivete to yeah. think, at least in my at least in my town. Right. People weren't going to be concerned about that. And certainly they're stu- they're young students who are, by the way, you know, it's interesting. These young boys especially are a lot more fluid. They're a lot more comfortable with touching and, and, and certain kinds yeah. of behaviors. And I mean, the kids who traditionally wouldn't be the jocks, the, the tough guys, right. you know, they're they're right. snuggling and even kissing in some cases, but they don't identify as gay. They're just there. There's less right. of a ju- like you saw behavior like that anecdotally. And you thought, well, at least the kids wouldn't be. But. Yeah, I was wrong about that. I, I thought I thought a couple like a year ago that this issue of gay rights was was would pass quickly and that to to sit as opposed yeah. to abortion, yeah. where 15, yeah. 16 right. year olds are all sure. for gay rights. Abortion still hard. Yeah, we didn't think I that was, was going away. I, I was wrong, too. Though. Yeah, 
but this is not, but, but it's going away. It's not going away. Pete. Let's be clear. It's not going away because of religion. If it wasn't for religion, it would in fact go away. And I'm, I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I've never wanted to hide the ball on that. You know, I wrote a piece eight years ago saying discrimination based on faith is through discrimination in the daily beast, but I'm just going to keep saying it louder and louder. It is really predominantly people of faith who are against equal rights for gays and lesbians. And don't forget it. That is where we will end it. If you're hearing yeah. Eric Siegel for the first time, you're going to want to go read his books and articles and follow him on social media and listen to his podcast, Supreme Myths. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. And thank you for listening to the Saturday special Saturdays with Siegel. Siegel Saturdays, I don't know what we're calling it. I don't brand things. I don't have a promo team or a writer. We're just flying by the seat of our pants. So we are so happy that you listen today and hopefully you'll subscribe and even better with a paid subscription because this is what I do. And I hope it was a public service and of all of your interest today, especially my conversation with Eric Siegel. Go follow him on Twitter at Eastpin Siegel. Get his books. Listen to his podcast, Supreme Myths, and thank you. Have a great weekend. I'll talk to you again, of course, on Monday right here on Stand Up with a more robust, comprehensive, quote, show. Bye-bye.